Alberto used the metaphor of the gardener to explain the role of what he calls the design factory. I, I use the term design company. I would, I would like to call it that design needs a father and a mother. And uh, I mean, you can decide what is the father and the mother, is it the designer or the design company, but obviously it needs both. And uh, uh, when the design company disappears, it's, it's more difficult for, or it may be impossible for design to bloom. And the, the design company is really a very special um, constellation. It uh, mixes commerce and uh, culture in a, in a strange way. And uh, for us particularly, uh, in the more northern, the, of course the Werkbund that you mentioned was very, very important. This meeting in 1907 of artists, architects and industrialists later the Bauhaus, and the idea was always that what, what the artisan re united as aspects of commerce, art, and technology would be reunited on an industrial level with a result of a modern aesthetic, moral, industrial culture. And unfortunately, it didn't happen in a big way, but it happened in a small way with companies, of course, the the greatest, in a way, was the Olivetti company under Adriano Olivetti. But in America, there was the Herman Miller in the era of the Dupree family or Knoll under the leadership of Hans and Florence Knoll. They're relatively rare because they need a particular constellation. They live best, as Alberto's company shows, in a family company context because uh, while uh, Profit is very, very important and very, very welcome. It's not the only criterion, and it does many things that maybe an anonymous shareholder would not care for. And uh, the bottom line is not the bottom line. That's for the design company. And uh, it's often in a slow business. You don't find them usually grow enormously. Uh, but but uh, while they're there, they're, they're very good. They disappear often. After a couple of generations, either they disappear because they ignored the bottom line or, or because they took it too importantly. Then they grew a lot and they become bigger companies and they are then uh, run by other, type of, other types of people. And as you saw when you talked about your designers very much, some of are the same, they work also with us. The designers have a lot to say in the design companies. They are not just there to make pretty products, but they, they set, or set the directions together with us, and often we're driven by them much more than we, we drive them. Also, the design company has a point of view. It, uh, uh, that, that might sound a bit pompous, but uh, design can be in the service of emancipation or suppression, and I guess it's a, a real political discipline. And, Every object sends messages and we are bombarded daily, hourly, every second by messages of our, of our surroundings, of our environment. And um, good, good design is civil design and emancipating design, not just well-designed design. Also, in the design company, everything matters. It's not looking for excellence in a specific field. It, how things are done, how a text is written, how a reception welcomes, how a workstation feels, etc. So the design company is not about, or not only about making beautiful things, it is about making everything beautifully. And beautiful doesn't mean just good looking, it implies honesty and on, on authenticity and clarity. It has its enemies, like copying, it has enemy, also now this misunderstanding of design that makes it sometimes difficult now. Uh, the misunderstanding is that design, yes, it provides aesthetic pleasure, but it creates products that are more extensive and less functional. And that is a very hard misunderstanding, and because that, that is not what design is about. And you all should remember Charles Eames' idea, which was to make the best for the most for the least. And styling, which is in a way something else, is just uh, an aesthetic kick for more. Design companies mix culture and commerce in a particular way. And you could talk of cultural capitalism. However, 
that usually is meant in a very negative sense, uh, like Jeremy Rifkin saying the new forces of cultural capitalism could end up devouring our remaining cultural resources. Now, the design company sees that in the opposite direction. Uh, it thinks cultural capitalism could be that culture takes over capitalism. And uh, I think it's not so hard to imagine cultivated CEOs who invite the artists and architects and designers to think about strategic goals. I think it's starting to happen. And shareholders who insist that uh, percentage of sales should be used for philanthropic use, purpose, and, uh, and so on. And I think in, in, in capitalism being at, cross, at the crossroads, and I think state can correct capitalism, of course, and is doing it now. But the other way would be that as the environment changes, the capitalist company mutates as a consequence of a well-understood self-interest and shareholders' insights that is a more sustainable business model with a better long-term return. I think that would be a possibility now. Now, a short look at the European scene and maybe also where it differs from the American one. Of course, the American companies like Herman Miller and Noll were, for, for us, the great, great, great examples of design companies. But in a way, they become big companies now and they have changed and have to change also criteria. Also in Europe, the number is shrinking. Uh, uh, some financial groups are now buying design companies in the home to develop them beyond what the founders or the families could do. Uh, some change, take Brown since Dieter Rams departed. Uh, but still, I think there are a, a number of, 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 of good companies and the good side of Europe, it's so fragmented that nobody can really get big. So there are many opportunities of smaller, medium-sized companies. Also, the public is maybe larger than here. Uh, in, in countries like Germany and Switzerland, the bourgeoisie is really with the modern. The, the, the Calvinist work ethic and the austerity of the modern work very well together. And you find the modern, maybe not in France though, you, you mentioned examples that in France that's different. The elite bourgeoisie does not, did not embrace the modern, but say in Holland, in Switzerland, Germany, in the Nordic countries, the, the, the bourgeoisie embraced the modern. So it, it becomes, even in the political scene, for instance, uh, the German uh, chancellors, chancellors, they, they have been sitting on Eames since, since Erhardt, or in the German parliament, this seating by Bellini that we delivered. So uh, it's in the public eye. And uh, this has also con consequences for distribution. Uh, uh, I was just in Houston, which is, I understand, a city of 4.5 million inhabitants, and it's very, very difficult to find a contemporary design there. There's maybe a design within reach, but in a, in a small town like mine, I come from Basel in Switzerland, 200,000, less than 200,000 inhabitants, there are at least 10 places where you can find design. Of course, here you have wonderful places like Moss or Nazir's shop in Luminaire, but they're rare, and in Europe you have them all over, which of course helps also design to be distributed. Americanization didn't happen in that field. I mean, you often hear that uh, globalization is just a euphemism for Americanization, but it's, it's not true in Europe for design. Even the a great chair, like for instance, the Aeron chair by Herman Miller, never really made it to, to Europe. It's very strange. So these cultures are fragmented, even within Europe, if when you're in Scandinavia, it's very different from being in Italy. And all this helps us to, to keep keep many companies around. Copyright laws are a very, very important issue for design company. They're pretty good, especially in, in, in areas like Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands. Uh, while, for instance, it, Italy, which ironically has the worst copyright laws, the, uh, copying is very easy. But generally, I think there is an improvement in, 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 this, in, in this field. So, while Europe has, has, has there's still much to do, but there is a potential and there are still companies around, so uh, uh, this, this marriage, this father-mother can help, uh, can still happen in Europe in, a, in, a, in, a, in many places. Uh, I'll 
talk now about the Vitra project, and I understand again the time limit, so I'll do it in a real rush, because I was not aware that it was so short. We call it project because while the company of course, is the motor, the economic motor, it embraces other things. There's a museum, there are archives, there's a site, there are publications, there are workshops. All that is part, part of the project. It started... That's where we are. It's between Germany, Switzerland, and France. This is hard to read, but these are all the influences that come to us from different parts of the world. You showed that image before, I think, or a similar one. That's part of what, what we do. And that's where it started. Actually, the project started here in the USA in 53. My father, who know, knew nothing about design, was in New York. And from a taxi, he spotted a chair and was fascinated and wanted to produce that chair. It was a chair by Charles and Ray Eames. And then a couple of years later, he, he got the license to produce these, these chairs by Eames, but also by Nelson uh, in the United States. And for us, uh, that was, and for him, that changed his life, and indirectly also for us. And I was lucky because my father didn't speak English, so with 16 years old, I could be around the, the Eames and Nelson and help my father and in translation, so I got uh, early, um, I, I, I got really infected. And I saw people, I've never seen a people like that, and that was the beginning of my fascination with design was with the people, with people like Eames and Charles and Ray and George Nelson, these were very, very special people, obviously. And then I learned about the design was not just doing product. I could go to the Eames office, see all the things they did, the films, the exhibitions, the, 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 the programs for, for other countries like the Indian Report, etc. And it was all done with very modest means. That was another lecture. That's just photographing in the backyard of the office the studio with all these different activities it gave me a very broad idea of design. And I mentioned it also because I think European design also was very much influenced by the Eames practice. And of course the house did hear a new idea. It was not sort of the settings that were clean and clear, but it was a collage that was also a new experience, the playfulness, you know, the, the European modern was often very austere, so uh, there was a playfulness about it. And these are products we still and do produce today by the Eameses. And even new products, for instance, that is an elephant that, uh, imagine it very small like that, uh, uh, that the Eameses designed in the 40s as a part of their experiments with plywood, and it was very difficult to produce it at the time, and we we just reintroduced or introduced it has never been produced this elephant the other figure was george nelson much less in the minds today maybe we just do we have an exhibition in our museum we, we created that exhibition for the 100th birthday of nelson and nelson had many other qualities that uh, he was a, a great writer as you say as you know the best writer i think that has on design that I have ever read. And he had a, a, a mind that was very good for systems. And in design, you have some innovations that stay because they are seen, they enter a product iconically. There are other innovations, like systems innovations, that are as important, but they become everybody's. They become state of the art. And many of the Nelson ideas, like the L shaped desk, uh, the office arena, etc., became just. The, the general way doing offices for, for, for the whole society. So these are designers very important, but they are not expressed so much in the product, but through their ideas. For instance, the action office, that was a revolutionary office program. And then, of course, we all know Nelson. These are all products we do from the iconic 50s uh, products, but that is not all that Nelson was. That's a chair just we also just raided it, so it's, this is not dead material. It's, we always do, we dive into the archives and do things again. 
the third figure at the time of greatest in, in, importance and influence on us, on me, was Alexander Girard. And uh, he, much before the postmod, the term postmodern, he was a postmodern. He brought all the decoration, he brought color from, from, from India, from Mexico, objects. And it, it was an enchanted world, because again, the, the European modernism being often on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the strict side, this was a completely new and different story. And as a friend of Eames, they did many projects together. By the way, just the one, the house you saw in the morning, the, the Miller house, that is being part of the museum and stand or is being given to the museum, was a cooperation between Girard and Nelson and Saarinen. It was a great shop in, and we, we do also, again, we do many products, but there are quite a few, and uh, just for instance, these puppets. Uh, so the, the Vitra story is one of doing very industrial things and also things that are uh, very, very handcraft. And so these were the three insights. The Eames as structure, Nelson as system, and Girard as decoration. Together, that formed a fantastic uh, trio. And when it was the first time in the United States in 1960 with the Herm Miller, they had less than $10 million sales per year. I mean, it's also an encouragement for smaller companies. You, can, you could do all, this, all these great people, and it was a, such a small company, and it was possible to do that. Ten years later, uh, I, I had another insight in the nature of design, and that is that designers, great as they were, they are not autonomous. They need a partner. And uh, that is the, the Panton story for us. Uh, Panton, Werner Panton from Denmark, was known there, was, a, was an enfant terrible. He didn't work in wood and didn't do all the nice things that you expected a Danish designer to do, but he was interested in plastic and... He, he, he was having, doing these environments, uh, total environments, and he had one idea, he was obsessed by idea, to the real plastic chair of, of the new time. And the, with this prototype, imagine this, this, this was not quite the size of a chair, it was small as now in our museum. He, he, wa he went th through Denmark and then through Germany, and didn't find anybody who wanted to produce it or go into it. Then he met my father in Basel, and actually he settled then in Basel, and uh, over the next years that, that chair was developed, and uh, much to the chagrin of Eames and Nelson, they didn't like the chair at all, they thought that was an error to do a chair like that. I will come to that in a minute. And uh, I w was also involved at the time with my father and Werner Panton to realize it, and this became then the Panton chair, the first cantilever in plastic, and an important uh, development in the, in the history of chairs. And these are products that uh, we do uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of Pantons. And maybe that's a moment to think about why would somebody great as Eames or Nelson not like that chair. And there are different ways to do design. That, that, and if you're in one way, you cannot appreciate the other way. That's clear. And Kahn made, Louis Kahn made a distinction between mosquito design and elephant design. And mosquito design is design which is additive. Now apply to a chair, it's a back, a seat, arms, legs, glides. And Kahn chose an Eames chair as an illustration of that principle. The elephant design gives an object an overall shape and integrates the different functions. And, co uh, and Kahn chose an Italian car by Pini and Farina as the example for elephant design. And Panton, of course, he could have chosen too because this is completely different from mosquito design. Mosquito design is this bringing these things together. And Eames also said, connections are the most important issue of a design. Here, there are no connections. It's a fluid form. You don't know where the leg, where the seat, and the back exactly start. And so it's something completely different. And so in many ways, one has to, there, there, there are different ways to do it. And from an Eames point of view, this was a mistake. From another one, it was good. By the way, many, many, of the better products are mosquito design because usually you solve the problem better, even if this creates very expressive and interesting design. Generally, one could say that, I mean, this was the 60s and 
that Panton design was much more than just a new chair. It was a new way of living. Everything, everything had to change. One had to sit low, one sat on the floor, one had total environments. And looking back, in many ways, now, these products, some have held very well, but these products look more dated than the older Eames chairs or Eames products. And one has to reflect on Charles Eames's hard words, which said, style reflects one's idiosyncrasies. Your personality is apt to show more to the degree that you did not solve the problem than the degree you did. At the same time, as Eames in France worked a designer that we weren't aware of at the time, but very similar idea, the construction, constructor, the structure, he, he, he thought, I mean, if you listen to it, it's exactly the same thing that Eames said, but it was on another material. It's, of course, Jean Pouvet, who is older than Eames, worked earlier, but there's an overlap. He did a house exactly with the same spirit as the Eames house in, in, in Santa Monica. And uh, this, this is even from the 30s, a fantastic object. He did these great chairs with architecture, uh, like architectural construction, uh, tables, constructions, and uh, we, we, I, for myself, I discovered the, the Prouvé only in the 70s and started to collect uh, Prouvé. And uh, at the time, the family of Prouvé looked for a producer because they had a problem with their small German producer. And then we started to produce that. So this is now an important part of our catalog. And just a short one on style. I mean, the interesting thing is Eames was so harsh on style, but one immediately recognizes a Prouvé design, or immediately a, a Nimes design, so maybe there is more to style than style. In 77, I took over the company from my father, and I was looking for new relationships and new, new ideas, directions for Vitra, and the new theme of the t was for us office, because before we were mainly in home and uh, some other places, but not so much in the office. And the man I was very interested in getting acquainted with Bellini. And that was the object that made me feel so strongly about it. That's an object he did where he was a design director, he was an independent designer, but also a director at Olivetti. And he did that little machine, Divisuma, which was a very good calculator, but also a pleasant object to hold in your hand, little nipples to, to manipulate, and it was a little totem. And uh, my thought was, couldn't offices be like that? Productive, yes, but also beautiful and, and fun. And uh, we developed many things with Bellini, and I can only give one, uh, uh, like this chair, which was feminine. That, Office chairs were masculine and were machines and were serious and uh, expressed ergonomics. And this was ergonomical, but it didn't express it so much. But it was a sort of a pleasant presence in an office. It changed the spirit. And another uh, very, very important experience was an exhibition where, where Michele and Ettore Sozas and Andrew Branzi worked together for an exhibition we did called Citizen Office. And, uh, it was a reflection, what is the office? And it's a place where people spent so much time over their lives. And uh, the, the thesis was that people in the office are alienated because this Tayloristic spirit of the office uh, is so concentrated on function and it excludes everything that is not directly linked to work. And in reality, people stay there, they live there, they have relations there. They, and why couldn't the, 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 the place of work be you know, closer to a place where you would like to live? And this sounds terribly simple now, but it was an, a very new thesis. And uh, this, this exhibition, Citizen Office, was, was a great influence on, I think, on, the, on ourselves, but also on the office industry in general. And that was the, the group then. At, and that, these were some proposals now, there were also some by Michele and by Branzi, but uh, of, of Sotsas for, for a less alienated work world. Uh, Citerio was the next person, he was mentioned this morning. That is now the classical work. We meet every two or three weeks, and we have done so 
over the last 25 years, I think. And it's area, we were the project together, this bringing these experience of the producer and the designer together and sometimes changing roles. It's not that the one thinks of money and cost and the other thinks of wonderful things to do. And it's both think changing roles. I mean, this, this gardener metaphor of that, that you used, Albert, is so, so good because it's, it's really creating an atmosphere where good things can happen, but that means also to think about the constraints and uh, I mean, under, under the roof of the Vitro project, we have very different designers and we need different designers. You have conceptual minds with a utopian touch and real, uh, realists with these, work this everyday bread and butter lines and you have technical minds and you have designers that are very expressive and that are reduced in shape. But this work with Chitero is really, that's a basic work for our everyday also our everyday business. And it's very interesting to see how design has, to, also when you go to this exhibition, how design has two, almost two faces. You have the face of the market and what is absorbed by the market and what, what works in the market. And you have the face of design as it is seen through the gatekeepers of the archives, people like Craig and others who say, this comes into our collection, this comes in an exhibition. There is a bit of overlap, but very little overlap. And in a sense, you can say of the market in Darwinian terms as natural selection and the collections, that we, I'm collectors ourselves, so we do that, that is unnatural collection. You collect the radical, the new, the, the exaggerated, uh, the, the things that have a great influence but never make it or are not even intended to make it for the market. It's two completely separate worlds with an occasional overlap. These are things, many office systems, chairs we did with, uh, with uh, that's just the latest program with Gio. another uh, designer working in this spirit Sorry. is Meda. Uh, he's the most uh, technical of our, he's an engineer, he's not an architect by training, he's an engineer and uh, he is so, so uh, into technology and is so, such a good const constructor again that he can make very complex things very easy. And that's what we need because so often technical objects are hard to deal with for somebody who is not the technician. So that is the a very important part of Meda's work for us. Offices, I just go very quickly through that. There are many, many uh, manifestations of offices that we, we are going through and uh, with different designers. And I'll come back to some of Jürgen Bay, who is here today. That's, these are ideas that Jürgen Bay developed for uh, reset in the office. I come now comment all these things, but there are many other things, and here you see a number of objects together. Also the office, oh, now I did something terrible, I guess. Can you, do you think you can go back to that image without? I, okay, great, I won't do that again. I tried to use the pointer. Oh yeah, uh, of course there, there's Stark, also office, but then there are completely different things. That's uh, things of Frank Gehry and Ron Arad, Noguchi, Kuramata, Greg Lynn. And uh, I, I show that, just say that's a, a wide range. The, the, the other, if, if the Eames is where the one great influence, other was Frank Gehry. And uh, Frank Gehry is so different. I mean, this is a world of pushing the envelope, doing the new thing. And again, like in, in the two mosquito and elephant design, there is this design that is driven where the, say, the exhibitionist drives are really lived. And uh, you do things that are very expressive. And Frank is very much on that. And he helped us also to overcome come a too narrow definition of design that we would have had maybe from, from Charles Eames. And uh, so he helped us to, over, to open the architectural ideas with many different architects. I won't talk about that project today. 
and, but also in design. He helped us to understand, and uh, you see that on that one side this expressive design, and then the other direction of design, of course the master of this, it would be Dieter Rams, where there's a sublimation of these drives into something of a more general ideal. And, and both, both uh, ideas or both directions create, can create great design. There are more silly things happening in the expressive world and more boring things happening in the other world, but both great, great products. You know, things we do with the, that's just a recent product we did with, with, with Frank Gehry for, a, for an office building he did in, in Basel for Novartis. And of course the other important figure for us was on these, Jasper Morrison, we I think work also for about 20 years. And uh, after the Memphis time, all this has been said before today, so I don't have to repeat that, how important he was as an example of a, a counterexample or, a, or a, a new way of design of normality, austerity, and still poetic. And uh, you have seen this image this morning, this is his chair, and we, we, we did also office work with him. That's a, a bit of an overview of products we, we did together. It's a latest chair, very simple chair. You've seen that chair in a way, but it's also a new interpretation of that chair. Another great designer uh, who had a difficult life and died so early, Martin von Severin, and he did this essential design. You, you cannot reduce it anymore, but it's not a boring minimalism. It's just essential, and uh, he did. That's things we, we did together. I wish we could have done more. Then the Burek brothers, that's a fantastic young face. We, they were, Gona was 29 when we started and, and Ewan 24. And they, they are on the one side so young and fresh and on the other hand so mature. I've never seen that together. And I think one very interesting aspect is also this pair that they can dialogue, it was like Charles and Ray, they're very different, and so a lot of this course is done. I see one minute left, so that means very, very, very fast. Uh, that's work with, we do with them. You know, these algaes. The, here I would have been a film, but we don't show the film. How do I do in the no? Can you get the, the next slide, uh, the next image? Hella Jungerius, a uh, fantastic figure for the, and for us so important because the textiles surfaces have become very poor over the last 10 years or so or more in design because the, it, it's a logistic nightmare to have uh, different textiles and different surfaces and Hella is, 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 has, has helped us greatly to overcome that. She, she, I mean, as you know, women are still a minority in this profession, but we worked with, uh, with Zadid and with, with others, uh, uh, Eva Yeritsna, April Grayman, and I'm very happy to have uh, Hela uh, in, 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 this, in this team. And she does textiles, colors for others, but also products uh, by, by her own, uh, like this sofa, which combines old and new. And uh, just now I just show pictures that is somebody you, you don't see usually in that humble position, that's Foster and uh, Kope Himmelblau and Arad. The whole discourse of the design art they cannot make. For us it's just an excursion. Uh, I mean we work with normal constraints normally and we love constraints but sometimes and for a while it's it's very interesting to work with different constraints, do things wildly impossible under any normal commercial aspect. And these were, and they lead to other things. They lead to new relationships. They lead to new ideas later in normal product. And while they're here, they create some very beautiful products like this table by Zaha Hadid. Greg Lane, that's a Maya Ha, Maya H, an interesting uh, architect from Germany. Jersey's work, you saw that this morning. Naoto, Kurosawa, Gricic. These were just recent projects. That's another project I can't. 
And here again, uh, Jürgen Bay in his slow car. Maybe he will talk about it tomorrow. It's a, it's a very, very interesting, very interesting project. Uh, and uh, it's a transversal project. I'm not going through that now. Many things to, for another time. Different expressions, uh, different styles of the work of the designer and the producer, and some of the results. New styles in communication, new, new images. The greatest, again, for us in communication was Thibaut Kalman, with whom we worked over years. This, new images from a book, the site, which I will not comment on. And just a final image uh, that is about exhibitions we, we are doing in our museum and how the museum changes with the collection. The museum itself is an interesting business model because the majority of its funds are it has to earn itself. The museum has its own products, its own commercial activities, which finance a large amount. Archives, like this is the Eames room, the Eames office, that is our publications, workshops. We organize in southern France and also on our site. A new building for which for our site, which is by Herzog de Meuron, which will open at the end of this year. And finally, the question uh, that maybe we discuss after is what, in these dire times, does design have an answer? Is the design company doing better than other companies? In the, in the Great Depression, it was here in America, design was doing very interesting things. For instance, the middle class, lost the possibility to have servants and so designers developed kitchens and spaces that could be dealt with without servants so that was a great uh, new idea for designers. Designers contributed and I think in these times we have that again. I think we the, the, to listen rather to than to business consultants to designers or work with designers on these issues I think will will get us new answers, new problems, and new answers. And I look forward to that. Thank you very much.